description of the gospel. We're going to particularly look at what the gospel is. Say gospel. Gospel Gospel's a funny religious word, isn't it, in some ways? It means good news. Like I said earlier, it means good news. It was a word at the time in the culture of the day when Jesus was preparing his disciples that actually meant good news. Um, Jesus used words uh, out of the culture that would have a relevance, even non-Christian kind of Christian words, if that makes sense. Apostle was a Roman word. And it means really not just good news, kind of like scandalously good news. That's, that's a better translation. And I wonder what the gospel uh, is to you. I wonder if you know the gospel. I wonder if you believe the gospel fully. I wonder if you've received fully from the gospel. Uh, An interesting moment happened in my life. About four years after I got saved, I was so hungry for God and I wanted to see the Lord move, the kingdom come. I wanted to be more immersed in the activity of the kingdom. And uh, I was just hungry for God and I wanted to preach the gospel, heal the sick. And I'd read this stuff in the scriptures and I ended up on a mission trip to India about four years into my salvation. And I was with a a, a healing evangelist in southern India. And we were going village to village on a rickety stage, preaching the gospel in deep Hindu idol-worshipping territory. Really exciting stuff, off the beaten track. And a little stage would be put up by the church, it would go ahead of us. And then the village would come out. They'd hear that a Westerner, maybe, or, you know, they kind of soup it up. And a white guy's coming into your village and they've got a message for you. Um, And 150, 200 people would come and they would sit in chairs and spend the whole evening listening to these traveling spiritual people. I don't know how they framed it. And uh, on, on night two, the guy I was basically carrying his bags, the evangelist I was following, said, I want you to preach the gospel tomorrow. And I was ready to give a testimony about my life and who Jesus was to me, but I'd never been asked to preach the gospel. This is four years in, and uh, I was, you know, hungry. I was in India. I bought the ticket. I was up for it. And I went away from, I said, okay, I'll I'll preach the gospel tomorrow, not knowing what that was, not knowing how to do it. And I didn't want to tell this man, Clive. I just went, yep, I'll do that, thinking... Ah, where are you going to find out what that is? Now, you may laugh and think, well, why didn't you know? Well, I hadn't been taught it, and i just never been asked to do it. So it was one of those things. And I went to the internet cafe the next morning, in, in our morning off, and I typed into Google. Google was relatively good, even back then. And I said, what is the gospel? Uh, into Google. And... <laughs> It led me to a really good little website page which scripturally unpacked what is known or what, yeah, what is known as the four-point gospel. Some of you are nodding. Who's heard of the four-point gospel? You may not have heard of the four-point this lady has, but it's a helpful tool and this isn't just a Google website. This is something, for example, used by T.L. Osborne, who is arguably the most used of God apostolic missionary in church history. That's a big claim. So this isn't just a a side issue. This is something which is going to equip you for the rest of your life. Billy Graham preached the gospel arguably the most, but apparently T.L. Osborne hit more nations and also his ministry was backed up with signs, wonders and miracles, which Billy Graham's wasn't so much. It was more salvation, Billy Graham's anointing. T.L. Osborne was major miracles and prolific in number. And he used the four-point gospel, and he teaches on it, and you can find it in his teaching. I commend to you the teaching of T.L. Osborne, this stuff on the internet. I want to teach you the four-point gospel, so that if someone says to you, oh, by the way, if you were told to preach the gospel for five minutes right now, would you be able to do it? Not a, no, this isn't a trick question or to make you feel bad, but put your hand up if you'd know what to do for five minutes if I said preach the gospel. Lady here, pastor. Okay, a smattering, but again, maybe more. Maybe you're, you're sort of holding back a bit. Maybe you all do. But I want to I cement some of this 
ethereal language, this Christian language, in something which is going to be a real tool for you and which you're going to be able to walk away from and know, I preached the gospel. I didn't not. I didn't mess it up. I was loyal to the message that Christ told us to preach. Okay? Romans 1.16 I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Paul writes, For it is the power, say power, power. of God to salvation for everyone who believes. The next verse, or certainly the next two verses, Paul Paul is constantly bringing people back to the gospel. Why? It's right there. It's the power. The power of God to save souls. The power of God to heal bodies. The power of God to deliver from demons and the devil is in the gospel message. It's not in anything else. So we need to know what it is, right? We need to know that we're carrying a sword of the Spirit and not a banana skin of the flesh. Let's go. Um, let me just read a few scriptures here. Galatians 6 verse 14. God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. I want to encourage you to get into that posture. Where's the boast? Jesus Christ crucified. That's the thing we boast in. That's the thing we, if you want to be a boaster, be one. But boast about the right thing. Boast about Jesus. Boast about what he's done. This was Paul's uh, posture. Paul, famously in 1 Corinthians 2. In fact, it's key scripture really uh, is 1 Corinthians. In fact, we'll go there now. 1 Corinthians 1, if you could just go with me in your Bible. So, making notes, Romans 1, verse 16 to 18. He says it's the power of God. He then says it's the righteousness of God. A lot of people know Romans 1, 16. A lot of people don't know so much Romans 1, 18. Which is it's the righteousness of God from faith to faith. Um, we are living, just a little side issue here. We are living, we will never get away from the issue of righteousness. The issue of righteousness, you might think that's religious language. Everyone is talking about what is righteous, what is right. The question is, are they talking about the righteousness of God or really the righteousness of man? So we are living in, in a sort of post-Christian culture and society that now has replaced the righteousness of God with the righteousness of man. And the best, in my view, the best summation for that is the religion of wokeism. It's virtue signaling, it's tolerance, it's actually calling things that the Bible says are evil, good. But the point is, is there's a whole religion there. There's robes, there's prophets, there's, 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 there's cause, effect. You can be cancelled if you say the wrong thing. You can be lauded and called holy if you say the right thing. Point is, there's a righteousness. It's just been changed. And the righteousness of God is the gospel. From faith, Paul writes, in other words, it's through faith to faith. So we get saved by faith and we carry on being saved by faith. Okay, we receive by faith. You get into the kingdom, you get born again by faith, and then it carries on by faith, not by works. Not by works. Okay, that was the Galatian church problem. They got saved by grace through faith, and then they said, well, let's get circumcised. Let's work it out. And legalism, witchcraft, got in. Okay, I don't want to divert too much from here, but this is all the gospel. The gospel, it's faith to faith. Hallelujah. It's the easy yoke. It's received. It's a free gift. It's a new covenant. Better promises. And so I'm going to try and unpack this four-point gospel in this next session. But let's just go, into, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And let's go from uh, verse 17. Now, <clears throat> we're going to flow right into 1 Corinthians 2. And of course, chapters and verses can be really helpful. I love knowing the address of a scripture. But I, sometimes it can be unhelpful because we, 
we sort of seclude bits of scripture that Paul didn't actually seclude. Just a point that's helped me. Verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. You guys are sent to preach the gospel. Your life will preach it, your words will preach it. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. There's that repetition of the word power. The power of God is in the cross. The power of God is in the gospel. And what you're going to see in a second in 1 Corinthians 2 is where, what is the power of God, by the way, on the earth? Huh? What, what, how does it operate? Yes, it's the gospel. It comes through the gospel. Well, what is the actual power? If, so, if a power encounter happened to you now, which I pray it does, what would it be? How? Right, but who, okay, better question. Who would do it? Thank you. I, I, I should have phrased that better probably. It's the Holy Spirit, right? And, and, and angels, okay? Angels do it as well at the bidding of God. Um, so the Holy Spirit loves what message? The gospel. You're going to see that in a second. The Holy Spirit gets excited by the gospel. And so do demons. Excited in a different way. Okay. For the message across is foolishness. With us it's being said, it's the power of God. Verse 19. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Key verse coming up. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Some of you, particularly the intellectual types, particularly those who like to be esteemed um, as wise, and probably that's all of us on some level, you know, our flesh does, right? We really need to get this and let it land. That the message of the cross is foolishness. <coughs> To save those who believe. Verse 22. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So the gospel is the power of God and it's the wisdom of God. Verse 25. Key verse. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than man. It's kind of almost like a, a, a what's the word, um, a riddle, that verse. Does anyone feel like it's a bit like a riddle? Hard to get your head around? The foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. It's coming against the spirit of the world. It's coming against the pride of life, which is what we're so entrenched in, we're so immersed in it, that we don't, that we miss it. And it's actually how Satan missed it. But it's glorious. For you see your calling, in fact, um, I need to probably not no, no, just just <coughs> read that in your spare time and flip flip with me. In fact, just go down to verse um, verse thirty. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became you're in Christ Jesus, who became for us the wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Again, Paul unpacking what is in this gospel. What's what did he pay for? What's what's for people to pick up what's for us as believers to receive in our own lives <coughs> and what having received can we then offer to people what's in our message and again the message isn't just what you speak it's who you are right that's why some people you get around them they preach and it's just like 
suitcases of glory is laid out because they've owned it, they've walked in it, they carry it. That's called authority. And then others, you know, you're just doing your best, maybe you're new into the faith and you're giving the message, but it doesn't have the weight on it because you haven't necessarily picked, up, picked it up. You haven't walked in it. So it's just as important for the believer to receive from the gospel as it is to preach it to lost people. Are you tracking with me? I hope I'm, I'm getting this across. But look what's in there. Verse 31, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. And I, brethren, when I came to you, I didn't come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined, key verse, to know, not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. There's the gospel. I was with you in weakness and fear, much trembling. There's an encouragement to anyone who gets nervous. If you're walking with limps, this is what we need. We need that weakness, that absolute dependence on him. Uh, uh, my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. You could say, but in the foolishness of God. But they were in the demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. Paul knew here that the Holy Spirit demonstrates over the gospel. We're messengers. We're the postman and we preach and the Holy Spirit moves through us and works around us touching hearts. So the pressure is off us. Paul knew that he wasn't there to try and persuade in his own carnal manipulative ways he was to be a fool for Christ deliver the message and let God do the saving let God do the convicting okay that's John 16 a it's trusting fully that God could, does only what God can do with his gospel message are you tracking with me So that people, when they get saved, they trust in the power of God, not in the power of Dominic Muir or Pastor Paul. If Pastor Paul has to go off and be a missionary in another country, the church doesn't fall apart because the power is in the gospel and the glory is to God. And I'm afraid in parts of the Western church you have these charismatic leaders who've got a natural gift of charisma, even a natural leadership skill, and when they have a moral fall or go, the church falls apart. rather than a church being built up through the proclamation of the gospel and the move of the Holy Spirit. Simple people, messengers preaching the gospel of power, the gospel of redemption, the gospel of sanctification, the gospel of all the things Paul talked about. Okay? Hallelujah. So let's just get, let's get on to uh, what is the four-point gospel. Uh, how long do I have, Paul, in this session, please? 20 minutes. 20 minutes left. Praise the Lord. Okay, number one, God's good creation. Write this down. <coughs> number one, God's good creation. Uh, just above that, if you've left room, I want, you to, I want to ask you, what's the gospel in one word? Well, that's the meaning of it, yeah. But if you had one word to preach the gospel, what would you say? Cross. Cross. Good guess. I would disagree, but good guess. Okay, shall I give you the answer? Anyone got any other answers? Huh? The kingdom. Good. Could be King Charles III, though, but yeah. It's hard, right, with one word. Huh? Pretty. Pretty. Pre. Pre. Oh, pray. Sorry. Uh, good guess. I would say it's Jesus. Jesus. Do you know what Jesus means? Yeshua. God saves. It means God saves. So that's why Jesus is that. And also, if you've got one word, you can preach the name above every name. When you preach Jesus, devils <coughs> flee. Angels bow. So one word, you are affecting the spirit realm. You're bringing the most powerful word available on human lips. So if you've got one word, you only... Jesus, God saves. In the spirit, you're releasing that message that there is a saviour and his name is Jesus. He lands, the Holy Spirit lands and glorifies the name Jesus. So you can't do it in one word. One verse. Most people get this. One verse. <coughs> Gospel in one verse. 
John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. You know, oh, it's all in the four points in this John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in Jesus will not perish but have eternal life. It's all in there. And here we get to point number one, God's good creation. When you preach the gospel, you're... You're proclaiming God, his reality, his creation, his goodness, and the fact that he's God no one else is. We live, particularly in London, in an incredibly humanistic society. Everything's about humanity. Buildings, thoughts, opinions. Man is central. Man's dust, friends. Man is a vapour. But we are so removed from a biblical plumb line of reality that when you preach the gospel you straight away point people to God and you make man periphery God central you proclaim God he's the creator, he's good he made it good he made you, you're not made up you can't change who you are, your sex this, that and the other, he's God he knows what he's doing, he loves you he's good, he made creation good He's still good. He's got good plans for you. He loves you. This is what you're doing. You're powering in with God's good creation. And you're, you're laying the table for point number two. Who wants to have a bash at point number two? By the way, never be embarrassed about the creation story. I'm not saying anyone is. But we need the creation story to understand point two. We are living in a fallen world. And God didn't create it fallen. So when we don't preach the fall or the creation as God intended it, particularly man made in his image, imago dei, we're made in the... You, I tell people when I'm preaching the gospel, I'm always like, you are made in the image and likeness of God. You're created. You're not an accident. I hit it hard. I come against the lies of atheism, the lies of, you know, just amorphous stardust careering through a meaningless universe you're just like a monkey no you're not you're made in the image of God you're fearfully wonderfully made because identity has been hijacked by the devil always will be but particularly in our day today right so I hit that hard I prophesied over people and then and his good creation but then I say I bring us on to point number two what's what point number two have a bash someone Point number two of the four points. No? No guesses? Hmm? Good guesses, thank you. I, have, I like, when I teach, I like to, like, elicit. All good, it's not quite, you, you, this is point three, really. Um, it's, are you ready? Write this down. Satan's deception and man's rebellion. Satan's deception, man's rebellion. One second, here we go. Um, I just need to get a quick thing about this. Just one second. Satan's deception and man's rebellion. Say that with me. Satan's deception and man's rebellion. So what you're doing with point number one, God's good creation, is you're laying the table for... In some ways, it's e you could say it's easy to talk about the goodness of God, the love of God. Actually, none, none, no, nothing in the gospel proclamation is easy. But in point, if there is a but, point two, you're going to hit... You're going to expose darkness. Again, all truth exposes darkness, right? But here we're talking about, we're going to start hitting the issue of sin, Satan, and man's rebellion. These are things man doesn't like to, you know, some people are like, oh, God loves me, great. Let's lick my ice cream, carry on with my day, right? Now you're going to have to let the law do its work. Okay? John Wesley, 
would say, I preach 70% law, 30% grace. Okay, the old reformers, old revivers, I, 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 I'm not in that anointing yet. But I'm leaning, Lord, help me preach the gospel. Let me read a quote to you from Reinhard Bonnke. An evangelist is a peculiar being. Do you know who I mean by Reinhard Bonnke? He went to be with the Lord about five, four or five years ago. 70, 80 million souls. An evangelist is a peculiar being. People ask me, when you stand in front of a million people, are you not nervous? My heart is shaking every time. I cry in my heart to God, Lord, here are people who will hear the gospel for the first time and for the last time. I am not here to make small talk. I'm not here just to be nice. Help me to preach the word so strong and so clear that every child will understand so that no one will stand before the throne of God and say, I am sorry I went to Bonky but couldn't understand. We need to preach the clear gospel, the gospel of salvation. The gospel I've heard in some places disturbs me greatly. They don't even know the evangelistic message. They have not been told. In Jesus' name, let's pre preach Christ crucified and risen from the dead. I get asked, how do you prepare your sermons? Church sermons serve meals. An evangelist is different. He is preaching to the lost. The evangelistic message is not a broth, a meal. It's a sword. Once you draw it, I know it will cut. And I go to the next city and I use the same sword. I draw it and I know it will cut. The more I use it, the sharper it gets. It gets sharper every time. The evangelist goes to the highways and byways goes to the sinners and draws the sword of the evangelistic gospel, it will cut. Don't forget that. This will face you. I'm not here to impress people. I'm not here to show how brilliant I can preach. I'm here to see people pass from death to life. I'm here to see people pass from the power of Satan to God. I'm here to see people pass from hell to heaven. That is where my applause comes from. You see, the sword is a picture of cutting. It's a picture of dividing, is it not? Light from dark evil from righteousness, hell from heaven, death from life. So an evangelist really needs to be sharp in these areas. What does he mean by cut? He's, he's talking about the sword of the Spirit, right, which is the Word of God. Really what he's doing is he's chopping down Adam. He's dealing with flesh. He's dealing with self-righteousness. This is what it means when Paul writes in Galatians 2 or 3, I forget which, says the, the law is our tutor to bring us to Christ. We need to, learn, we need to know the law and use the law to expose sin, to amplify sin, to, ex, to, to, to show man his rebellion, to show him that he is not self-righteous by himself, that he is a sinner. Because unless you know you are a sinner, you cannot cry out for a saviour. I'll say that again. Unless you believe you are a sinner, you will never cry out for a saviour. Now, where the enemy gets in here is he likes to make evangelists condemning. Like judgmental. Kind of make people feel condemned. No. There's a nuance here. The evangelist is to let the law condemn. Because, by the way, did you know that the, the law is the ministry of condemnation? Yeah. It's actually a ministry. It's supposed to do that unto Christ. So we're preaching a saving message. But we need to cut in order to do that. People need to be cut down at the root. That tree of the knowledge of good and evil actually needs to be, the axe needs to be laid at the root. So that we can spend the rest of eternity eating from the tree of life. You have people joining churches and living by the law. And they're self-righteous on their way to hell. But they go to church every Sunday. And they literally have the Ten Commandments above the altar. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are great, right? They're God's commandments. The law is perfect. It's good. But legalism is deadly. So what we do is we, we expose the fact that there is a deceiver, there is a satanic kingdom that rules over the earth. Satan has deceived. He did it in the garden. He does it today. He, he accuses man. He accuses God. We're beginning to expose 
the reality of that. There is a, there, there is a murderer, a thief. <coughs> and man is a rebel. Man has re rebelled and must repent. And this is where I, I bring in, in point number two, I bring in my, my testimony. I bring in the reality of people's lives. Suffering. God created a good earth. People are suffering. They're depressed. They're addicted to drugs. Even babies, when they come out of the womb, they come out screaming. It's not a world that's all, you know, roses, is it? Like, it's nice smelling roses. Like we're under a curse. Satan has deceived and man has rebelled. And you're hitting the law here. You're exposing man's sin. And, and, and this is where the reformers would do it so hard that people would cry out, saying, what must we do to be saved? You weren't twisting a believer's arm. You, sorry, you weren't twisting someone in the world. Please, can you join our church? Please, can you get saved? You were letting God do his work of conviction through his gospel message. And this is where you come in with point number three. Did that... Uh, uh, does anyone have any questions about that? That second point. How long have I got, Pastor? About ten minutes. Yeah, 10 minutes. Any questions? So basically, this uh, famous deception of the mass rebellion. You say that so we have to acknowledge our sin. Unless we acknowledge our sin, we can't be saved, right? Yeah. So the law brings the knowledge of sin. Um, so what I'll, what I'll do, it depends, and this is, this is an important point actually. The gospel, this good news, Christ and him crucified, which is, which is the gospel, raised from the dead, is, is the central message of power. It's the one the Holy Spirit backs up. And like I said, you can say it in one word, kind of, one verse. And the reason I, I say that is that in life, there are going to be all sorts of contexts, right? So if we went out today over lunch, some of you would have maybe two minutes with someone. And you'd be saying, Lord, what, how do I minister to this person? And I always say to people, try and get the gospel in. You know, that's where the power is. But you know what? You may not. And you, you're not, a, you're, not um, you're to be led by the Spirit, right? So you don't have to go away and go, oh, I didn't preach the gospel to that person, feel all condemned. No, you may have just been there to listen to them. And it didn't feel right to butt in and go, but you, do you know what I mean? So we're following the Spirit, but we're, we know we're sent to preach the gospel. So you may have 30 seconds, you may have two minutes, you may have 10 minutes, uh, you may have a stage where your pastor gives you 20 minutes. So what we're trying to do as evangelists is get versatile and get this message in our blood, get it under our bones, if you like, so that it can come out in all sorts of manifestations. You know, I, 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 I go around town, for example. I used to do it perhaps a bit more when my evangelistic calling was, was, was really in a, the place that it was. And I'd be on tube stations on the platform in London. And I would just address the whole platform, particularly a busy one. I loved that. That was my flesh, by the way. Pre-salvation. I'd hate that. A speech. And part of me was still hating it, like, I was in a Pauline like wrestle, like weakness, fear, much of me. And I would go, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, 100 people, commuters would look at me. I go, I have a message for you. And I know someone needs to hear this across this. And they're all standing there going, someone's addressing the whole underground. Like you could feel people's <laughs> amazement in a way, their embarrassment. It was great. And I would just give a 20, 30, 40 second gospel. Usually I would give them John 3.16. I'd spin it a bit to make it like I wasn't just quoting a verse. And I'd say, th I know someone needed to hear that. And I know that's it. And that makes it personal for them. So you'd have a whole, you'd 100, 200 people, bang. And I basically got my sharpshooter out and just sprayed the whole crowd and let God do the rest. Mm. Amen. Mm. Like, I want to spread seed. I want to reap in eternity. I want to give people the opportunity to get saved. I want to give them something that God can work with. I'm not just, hey, God loves you, um, sort of blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah, that's an important part of the gospel. 
But hey, God loves you and Jesus died for you and we're all going to stand before him and we're all sinners without him. How are you getting on today? Allow, give room for the Holy Spirit to move and convict around the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified. So in all of this, I'm saying, let's get the gospel, this four point thing, this message under our bones so that whatever context we're in, we can bring it out in different ways and let the Holy Spirit move. Does that make sense? You're going you're gonna to find, I, I find this a lot in London, that people are very self-righteous. They think they're good people and they think they deserve to go to heaven. But if you're nimble with your sword, within about two minutes, you can make people in a loving way, know that they're not a good person anymore. The other day I had someone on the street of Yeovil and he was basically rooted, I mean, absolute, so self-righteous. Like, you know, I'm a good person looking after my daughter. My whole life is to look after my daughter, he kept saying. You know, I want to be... And there was, a, there was a common grace on that. That was a sweet... There was a sweetness to it. But I could tell it was pushing against Christ and him crucified. And so I began to say... He, he did say a couple of times, I'm a, I'm a good person. And I said, really, according to whose standard? Mm-hmm. And he didn't, he'd never heard that question. I, and I began to say, do you know, so for, I said, say, for example, the Ten Commandments. So did you know them? He, he, he said he didn't. And I said, shall I quickly go through them and we can both test ourselves how we're doing? And I went through them and he, he basically admitted to being a failure in every single one. And I said, that's the Ten Commandments. Like, that's, the, that's God's standard. That's entry level. And he realized he was a liar, a thief a covetous person, a blasphemer, he dishonoured his parents, he was an idol worshipper, and a murderer. He hadn't actually killed people, but in, by the standard of Jesus, you know, and getting angry and cussing people down, he, he brought death. And so he was a far more ready at the end. He was like, he looked convicted. He was like, flip. Like he'd come off that self-righteous pedestal that is so prolific in the western world today under the righteousness of man do you remember wokeism oh i'm tolerant do what you want and that make you know i wave an, a, a rainbow flag therefore i'm a good person because you know wickedness according to god's standard so i needed to bring the law in to make a way for christ the law is our tutor to bring us to christ point number three is who can tell me what point number three is? Open deception. No, that's point number two. Point number one, God's good creation. Point number two, Satan's deception and man's rebellion. Point number three, Jesus Christ. it's all about Jesus. Yeah. Point number three is Christ's, I'm going to give it theological language because it is helpful, but basically it's Christ crucified. But the theological language is Christ's substitution, say this with me, Christ's substitution and satisfaction. Okay, two, two big theological words which don't need to be daunting because they're so loaded. That's why we have these theological words. Substitution is key. You see it from Genesis to Revelation. Sin always required a substitute. Right from Genesis, beginning of Genesis, right through to uh, uh, Revelation. In fact, from before the foundation of the world, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, was slain. He's slain from eternity and he's still slain in heaven. Do you know, we will worship the Lamb forever. That's a, a mystery, I grant you, but it's important we get that because when we, if we can ever get it, that's how big the Lamb of God is in Christian theology. Before creation and throughout eternity, he will forever be the Lamb. What does that tell us about God? So much. What does that tell us about the power of the cross? He becomes a substitute. There has to be a substitute for sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. It has to be perfect. Every other religion is a fake substitute. It's a fake sacrifice. Or it's us working our way to God. The only where God comes down to us does it for us is Christianity it's the only one with a raised Messiah as well 
So Christ's substitution, what Derek Prince has called, calls the divine exchange. Have you heard that expression before? This will change your life. In fact, YouTube, Derek Prince, the divine exchange. Jesus, the, verse, the best verse for me this is 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. It says this, For God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us that we might become that that there is the most one of the most pregnant words in the whole bible that that because it's an exchange the whole the whole of our eternity pivots on that one word that so god made jesus who knew no sin to become sin for us jesus didn't just take us sin he became it he became utterly repulsive to his father god had to turn his face away because he became sin and it says that. We better tap into that because to make it worth it for Jesus, right? If you love Jesus, that's why the Moravians, the ancient prayer of the Moravians was, may the Lamb of God receive the reward of his suffering. May they just chant it again. again. May the Lamb of God receive the reward of his suffering. May the Lamb of God receive the reward of his suffering. What is his suffering? What, is, what did the Lamb of God pay for? What's the reward? What did he pay for? You. 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 He paid for people. He paid for every last soul. He came for people. Is there more in there? Of course, there's healing, there's salvation, there's deliverance, there's blessing, provision. There's so much in what he paid for. And he paid on the cross. Because it said, For God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In other words, Jesus took all our sin so that we could have all his righteousness. And in the divine exchange, which Derek Prince, I would suggest, unpacks it the best, basically Jesus became our sinfulness so that we could have his righteousness. Jesus became our poverty so that we could have his riches. Jesus became our sickness, was beaten with many stripes so that we could have his wholeness and healing. Jesus became our, reject he was rejected so that we could be accepted. Jesus was shamed naked on a cross so that we could have glory and joy and freedom. He took all of the sin and all of the curse so that we can have all of the blessing and all of the righteous standing. Amen. Hallelujah. Free gift. Free. Simply by receiving. That's what it means at Christ's substitution. Okay, I haven't got too long to unpack this. The second part was what? Satisfaction. Do you remember I said satisfaction? Do you understand? Do you realize, do you realize how many angry people there are? Today there's a lot of angry people, aren't there? You noticed? And by the way, that, there's nothing really new there. The reason why human beings get angry is because of sin. We live in an unjust, broken world and people are emoting. And they want justice and they've been sinned against and they've been abused. It's interesting to me that we live in probably the thickest age for a while of social justice. A, a, a kind of craving for justice, right? But we don't like the judge. We spurn the judge. The social justice movement spurns the judge. Okay, I'll, I'll just park that there. But, but what I'm trying to say is that there is an anger that God has. We're made in the image of God, and when we are angry, it actually points to the ultimate... Uh, it should point us to the fact that there is an ultimate judge who will, who is angry at sin. He's angry with the wicked every day, the psalmist says, because he's a just judge. Now, the difference with God's anger is it's righteous. It's a righteous anger. Human anger is what? Unrighteous. It's carnal. It's demonic, the Bible says. That's why anger is so destructive, is it not? Yeah. Anger is, is murder in nappies. Okay? But there is a righteous anger, and God had to appease. There has to be an appeasing. It's called, the Bible calls it propitiation. That's another theological word propitiation Jesus is the propitiation of our sin who knows what that means paying for appeasement there's an appeasement do you realize there is a day of wrath coming I think I talked about it in that preach there is a day of wrath coming because God is angry at sin and it won't just be swept under the carpet he can't do that he's not like us he's not fickle where it's like oh, I'll just let you off we, we, we even think that's noble to do that it's not actually it's not noble, it's unjust. But because God's so loving and because he's got mercy, the only way he can let people off 
is someone has to pay. So Jesus is the propitiation, the appeasement for divine righteous wrath on that cross. Jesus satisfied it. That's why God's not angry with me. I'm a saint. I'm well pleasing to God. He loves me. The wrath of God does not hang over me, a born again Christian, but it does hang over the unbeliever. And rightfully so. This is deep. That's John 30. John 3, verse 30, I think it is. The wrath of God abides over the unbeliever. Now there's a paradox and a tension here because how many of you know that the, the, the father in the prodigal son story wasn't hands crossed, I'm angry with you, kind of, you're not coming into my house. Because his wrath is holy. He love, his love, his grace, his dispensation of mercy and grace, which is available now to people, in spite of that anger that's there, is open. So we don't preach an angry God in that sense. We preach an, a running father, but we do preach wrath. And it's coming, but Jesus took it. Jesus satisfied it. So we preach the cross hard here. The substitution, the satisfaction. And we can appeal to people and say, do you know what, you're angry at this, you're angry at that, and some of that's God-given. Like you're made in his image and you don't like injustice. But what about you? Where are you? Have you ever sinned? Do you ju deserve judgment? Again, bring it back. And then people are like, flip. You know, if they're, if they're open, some people, the walls go up and they're proud and they carry on fighting against God. But others are like getting convicted at that stage. And you as a servant of God are preaching the gospel to them and making a way for them to come to Jesus and say, I'm guilty. I deserve wrath. I deserve judgment. Jesus, thank you. I call on you. I repent. Bam! They get saved. Point three, Christ's substitution, satisfaction. Point number four, I've gone over a little bit. How much have I gone over? Five minutes, ten minutes? Yeah. Yeah, five minutes, five minutes not too bad. What's point number four? Are you still awake? Restoration. Good, restoration. And one other word. It's back to man. So we started with God. God's good creation, Satan's deception, man's rebellion, Christ's substitution, satisfaction. Point number four, Man's repentance and restoration. So the command, Acts 17 verse 30, said God commands all men everywhere to re repent. Repentance is not an option, it's a command from heaven. And by the way, I love repentance. If I don't know what I'd be without repentance. Every day, all throughout the day. Repentance gets a bad press from the devil because he knows how powerful it is. Repentance is a one-off to get you saved and it's a continual. Repentance is our way to light and life and everything good. So, repentance, metanoia, the Greek word is metanoia. It means to change your thinking and to change your ways. It's a change of mind and belief, but it's also a change of direction. It's basically a change from darkness and lies and sickness and disease and hell to light and truth and freedom and healing and wholeness and everything heavenly. It's a command, but it's beautiful. It's a command, yes, it's offensive. It challenges everything carnal, independent, idolatrous man stands for. You preach repentance, you're not going to be popular. But if you understand what it really means, you can preach it in a way that loves people and calls out to them for the kingdom that's right there, right at hand for them. But you must repent. Don't soften that. Okay? And what are they repenting into? You said it. Restoration. Full restoration. They're not, they're not repenting into, well, you're just joining a boring church for 50 years. Which a lot of people think, unfortunately. They go, well, why would I join that church where people are, look so bored and look so... Look, I know the enemy lies, but, but some of us Christians need to repent and actually have some Jesus in our lives. Amen. Have some joy. Have some freedom ourselves. So this is why actually, as I said at the beginning of this message, the gospel's for us today. Luther said we, for, we need to hear it preached every day because we forget it every day. No good Jesus. Hmm? Intimacy with Jesus. No good Jesus. Intimacy with, we're being restored into intimacy with God. 
we can actually know God, experience God. Like, who wouldn't want that? The gospel is so awesome. But we're also being restored, that's that word restoration, into how he intended us to live. Everything restored and realigned. And what this does is it really beats against the religious message of you just join a church, hope for the best until you get to heaven. You kind of grin and bear it until, uh, get us out of this place. No, that's not the Christian message. The Christian message is thrive and live in it, in the carnage, in the chaos, as an overcomer, restored to God's original plan for humanity, the last Adam. First Adam messed it up. Everyone's in Adam. I'm now in Christ. I'm in the last Adam. I'm a new creation. There's the restoration. I'm an I'm a t- entirely new race, seeded by God now. I came forth in Adam through my father and mother. I'm now born again. I'm a new creation, seeded by God's willy. Sorry to put it... Uh, uh, a little bit crudely sometimes we need to hear it as it is actually that did feel a bit crude but it's okay I've had I've been meditating on on what it means to, to be a seed on a seed I, I live in the I live out in the farm farmlands of Somerset there's so much in creation that speaks of the kingdom the seed the word that goes out Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. That was of Jesus, but it's also of us. I'm learning this now. We'll keep coming back to this, particularly as we hit evangelism. I'll do a little um, cliffhanger. Pretty much my number one, my number one key for evangelism is turn up and die. Sorry, Pastor, I want to go over. But um, tell us what's next. We just pray. Let's just pray. Let's feel to pray. Father, thank you so much for your glorious gospel, Lord, for Jesus Christ crucified, raised from the dead. Lord, what that means for us as your children, what's available, Lord, as we drink and eat of your gospel for the rest of even eternity, and also, Lord, what it means for the lost, what it means for us as messengers and ambassadors, carriers, harvesters, warriors. Lord, would you do deep work, even by your Spirit? Lord, would you impart even the Spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus, enlightening the eyes of our hearts to know the hope of your calling, the glorious riches of your inheritance in the saints, the exceeding greatness of your power towards us as believers. We ask that in Jesus' name. Precious, precious name. Amen. Amen. Give the big clap for Jesus. Did you enjoy, yeah?